So I am uh, really excited about uh, you all being here and uh, taking time to connect. I know when we first had this conversation about collective impact, uh, we were just having a ideation about how could this conversation look practically for church leaders, uh, for nonprofit leaders, how do we see this idea of collective impact? So I want to just frame this, nestle us into that thought process today. And even as we're talking, think about what your definition or what you believe collective impact is and what it looks like for you and your sector. Um, but I, I do want to allow Chuck and Jen some time just to give a nice introduction of themselves to everyone and then uh, I think we'll have a great conversation. So thank you. Thank you for having us. Um, I'm Jen Young. I'm the Executive Director for Impact 46. We are a faith-based community development nonprofit in Lawrenceville. We work alongside the city of Lawrenceville. Um, I'm from Lawrenceville, went to Collinsville High School, um, before that was even a cluster. So, um, But I grew up on a different side of Lawrenceville, so I never lived in the city limits. Um, and then went to college in uh, Augusta and loved Augusta so much. And that's really where my foundation and community development was nurtured, and it was nurtured by a pastor. Um, so I'm very thankful for the work that pastors do. Um, he discipled all of us as members and disciples in the art of community development through the lens of living in your city. And so we weren't really practitioners, we were just neighbors. And he came in and really kind of challenged us to see our church and our city and our neighborhoods as our Jerusalem and to really invest in that community. And that's really took off for me. And then I moved back here in May of 2014. So I've been back almost nine years, which is crazy. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Chuck Warpington, uh, the city manager for the city of Lawrenceville, St. Gwinnett County. Um, I uh, uh, am a native to Gwinnett County, um, and uh, I, went, I left Gwinnett County for a little while when I went to uh, Georgia Tech, where I earned an uh, engineering degree, um, and I actually spent a lot of my career in this area right here with an engineering firm uh, just across the street. National so, Championship at Georgia Tech. And so I was on the National <laughs> Championship team. Uh, I played, played a little football when I was there. Um, I don't have my ring on today. It's just it's a big thing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we've struggled the past several years. <laughs> I'm coming back. Um, uh, my interest into community really was more centered around infrastructure items, engineering, um, and things associated with that. Obviously, I did that as a professional career. And then uh, it, I moved into uh, doing being on planning commission at Gwinnett County, um, and there was zoning aspects of land use, and then ultimately that led me to being in the city of Lawrenceville now for seven years. And I want to pause there just a second because I do have three of our elected officials that are here, and I think that should tell you uh, the, the commitment that they they have with telling the Lawrenceville story. We have the, our mayor, uh, Mayor Steele is here, council member. Uh, Glenn Martin and Council Member uh, Victoria Jones are here, and I would encourage you. <laughs> You're going to hear a little bit of the story uh, that we have here in Lawrenceville, but without this leadership that's here, we also have two other ones, uh, two other council members as well. But with, without the, this type of leadership at an elected level, uh, we can't do the things that we're doing at a staff level, much less. Uh, at a, a community level with a nonprofit, which then gets us back to collective impact. So I think it all kind of all comes together. So I think the story that we have here is uh, at every level, uh, in my opinion, in the city right now, uh, we are clicking on all faces because we have folks uh, that are uh, all have the same uh, vision for improving the community at all levels and not leaving anybody behind. We'll tell a little bit more about this. Oh, I, I think that's beautiful. I, to ground us a little more, I think Chuck, you, you gave a great, um, another grounding moment for us in saying, why is this important for church leaders? Why is this important for faith leaders? Um, and I think Chuck hit on that, that they're going to go deeper into is, why are you not involved 
and what's happening in your city as a, as a leader of faith um, in a collaborative way. Um, how, as a, as a faith leader, as a church leader, as a business leader, are you, are you not seeking, or are you seeking um, the flourishing of your city by, by connecting with what's all, what God is already doing in cities? And I believe that Lawrenceville is a beautiful example of what happens when God organically knits together um, different aspects and different sectors to see the, the city's flourishing. So, again, I don't want to belabor because there's a beautiful story here, and I, that's where I want to start. I want, I want to know the story of Impact 46. Where does it start? How does it start? Who's brainchild? Where did they come from? So I actually came in seven years after it really started. It started with a prayer movement, um, and our mayor was um, a founding member of that group. Um, and what I deeply respected when I came in in 2018, after we'd incorporated in 2017, was deep respect for people that stopped and listened and really took kind of a Nehemiah approach of just, they see devastation exists, but let's step back for a little bit and not just start working or start another nonprofit, duplicate services, but they really began to pray over the city, ask for guidance, favor, all of those things that are needed in order for a movement to occur in a city. And so um, that's really where it started. It came out of um, Lawrenceville First United Methodist Church, where just people gathering monthly. And there was some coordination to those monthly gatherings. Um, and then they began to listen to um, influencers and leaders within the city from different sectors. And so what they started to see was that there was amazing leadership in education and business and in the neighborhoods and local government and in schools and nonprofits, but all of those different sectors were siloed out. So businesses will have business meetings together. They'll have some organization to all the businesses and, and people that are running in a, in a community. Teachers meet together. Principals have cluster meetings. They know all about education. But what was missing was the common denominator of where those things were, which is the city in which they were working, playing, living, mm -hmm. learning, and worshiping. And so there was nobody really kind of pulling all of those people together and having a deeper conversation about the city. And so that's really where Impact 46 began to form. And so it was incorporated in May of 2017, and I came on as executive director in January of 2018. And from there, that's where Collective Impact came into play. Because Collective Impact is much more of a strategy. It's not a program. And that's where people get it wrong is they think that they can just formulate another program or initiative or whatever word we put in place for program, <laughs> depending on how you feel about it. But it's a strategy, and that's why it works for us, because for seven years, the collective was being brought together. And so everybody wants to see impact first, but you can't do it unless you have people. And so we had the network, and so then when I came in, I was able to get to work, and that's what I'm good at. Um, but without that network of people and the collective agreeing on a common vision, there would have never been Impact or Impact 46 to where it is today. Yeah. Um, Chuck, I, I want to zero in because you have a, you also have a part in what this looks like, but you're not a faith leader in the sense of a church, but you're involved in government. What, what, was, what was your take on that inception of that thought? As a believer, I, am, I feel like I am a faith You are a faith leader. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to clear that. I wanted to make sure that was clear. Yes. Um, I, I, I'm going to start with my challenge and my punchline, which is probably not the right thing to do, but I think it will make my story that we tell here a little bit more impactful. Um, what has happened here with Impact 46 and the people that were engaged they, the group came together collectively wanting to, to come together. What can we do for our city? Instead of the group coming to the, to the government and saying, we're going to do this for you. Okay. So my punchline and the challenge is to you, don't come up with a program from your church and say, we go to the city. It could be a food drive. We're going we're gonna to raise, raise money or we're going to raise uh, an initiative to, to get food. And we're going to work with the government to do that. Find out what the government and the community really wants 
and then come alongside of that. It's the, it's the exact same program, if, if you're familiar with Henry Blackley's program, Experience of God, find out where God's at and go and move there. So in your community, find out where he's at and go work there. Yeah. So to, to kind of start from the beginning when it to the city, we have utilities. Uh, we provide um, gas, natural gas and electric uh, to our city residents. And then our gas actually goes and covers four counties. Uh, and so we, we have a touch point with a lot of individuals. And sometimes that touch point is you deal with people who are struggling. And so we were working with a well-known nonprofit. I won't call the name, but it was, if I'd say the name, you guys would know it. They're in the community, and this was not necessarily about them, but it was, it was the issue that they were not meeting the need that for us uh, to help residents who were struggling with paying the utilities. So we actually had a need. We need somebody in the community that's going to work with, with residents who are struggling to pay the utilities and actually have a customer service in place and actually do an application process. So that then led us to a group, uh, Impact 46, that we, we want to help meet that need. Um, and so we started a relationship with Impact 46 and said we will, we will work with you on that because it kind of meets uh, what, what we are seeing as well. And so it start, this started out very, very small where they would screen applicants who were uh, having an issue with uh, paying the utilities. And then from there, it, it, it began the whole process of a relationship. So the, the, the story behind that was, it wasn't that Impact 46 came to us and said, uh, we want to do this. Uh, it was, we want to work, work alongside, and how can we best work with you and, and use our faith-based initiatives to meet the goals of government. Sounds, it sounds easy, but a lot of churches, a lot of uh, faith-based nonprofits, they have their goal, they have their mission, we want to do this, and they want, to, they want to come to us. We have a lot of folks who come to us, we want to do this, we want to do that. Well, I don't need that, I need this. And then we never hear from them again, because that's not what they want to do. So when you think about collective impact, it's, it's the collective working together to, to solve the issues in your community. And when you all come together, it's amazing what the collective can do. Yeah, I, I, I want to zoom right back out real quick and, and say that it's okay for something, a movement, not to have a grand plan before it begins, right? That there's something organic about prayer, about just coming together and seeking what it is that needs the attention of the collective. That's a very interesting distinction because we don't hear that a lot. Uh, of seeing that. So, what role does that play in how uh, the government, how organizations can come together? What, how much of the faith aspect do you believe really influence um, kind of what we see in Lawrenceville now with the relationship with Impact 46? Well, do you want to take that first one? Yeah. So, I mean, I think from, from our standpoint, um, you know, I'm a little biased because um, mm -hmm. Faith is very important to me, and I think with individuals you see here from our council, faith is very, very important. Um, because there's, 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 uh, there's a deep-rooted sense of giving back to the community that you're here for a purpose, and that purpose is not here from your own. And so I think um, a lot of times um, organizations that, that aren't faith-based, you don't have that deep-rooted core why you're doing what you're doing. And so I think from, from, from my standpoint, as a city manager, that was very, very important. Um, and then also, there's that, the, the idea that every person matters. Um, the, it doesn't matter what you're going through. And then ultimately, having around those wraparound services. And so ultimately, that's kind of what led to what we're doing today with uh, uh, working with uh, extended stay hotels, uh, and relocating folks into a more stable environment out of, a re out of a, an extended stay hotel or um, a, an apartment complex that was built in the 60s or 70s that y'all probably read about in the newspaper, uh, a lot of some wards, trying to get a lot of these, these folks out of that uh, position and then using um, the organization Impact 46 who understands that it's more than moving somebody from point A to point B. Let's 
Let's determine what their need is. Let's determine what their barriers are. And then, and then we can actually help them to get point B and then ultimately it sets them on a, a, a standpoint to move forward. And moving from point A to point B does not mean you're moving out of the city of Lawrenceville. Uh, it, it's actually trying to uh, move folks out of a situation into a better situation and we, our goal is to keep you in the city of Lawrenceville. Um, for me, government really came into play with this strategy because of systems. So if you want to see human flourishing, you have to understand systems that either create flourishing or decrease flourishing. And so for me it was, I spent a lot of time looking at community development from a faith-based perspective. There's a lot of research on that, there's a lot of classes, there's now seminary classes that you can take and be devoted to that. However, what it doesn't touch is the systems that are rooted in government. Mm -hmm. So if you don't understand that, you're never going to understand housing and zoning and why those things are the way they are. So I realized that I had to get um, an armchair education in county government. And so I joined our planning and zoning commission so that I could better understand how to serve the city from a different perspective, but also still look at systems and how, how those affect the people that we're working with. So if someone that we're working with through the Lawrenceville Response Center is paying 60% of their net salary on housing when they should be paying 30, I need to know a lot about housing. Well, a lot of us faith leaders don't know anything about housing. Um, and so you'll start programs without understanding how to actually affect change. And so you actually create more problems within your city if you don't work with local government, if you don't work with other nonprofits. And so that's what I was seeing happening in several cities within Gwinnett is that more nonprofits were popping up. When you actually looked at the statistics and data, the cities were getting worse. Yeah. And um, you can say yes. I'll be right there. Probably gonna throw in an amen. You know what I mean? So um, I'm right there with you. <laughs> but but that's what I was seeing, and so that's that's not the purpose of what we were trying to do with our work. So you have to do it differently. So for those in the room, I would I would really encourage you to have lunch with your city government. Take a city council member out to dinner, out to lunch for coffee, get to know them, better understand what their role is, um, because they also don't hear thank you, <laughs> they just hear complaints. Um, so when we come to the table saying we're willing to serve, you need to have your hands open instead of closed and expecting them to adjust to you. We have to adjust to them and work together. You know, we, that's, that's a word, Jen. You may want to, you know, call an offering. <laughs> we, we say the tighter the geography, the, the, the greater the impact, right? If we can zero in on a particular neighborhood or a city, that and we can have buy-in from the sectors in that neighborhood, in that city, that are focused, center set on the issue. That we can see momentum in a in a whole in a whole different way. What has that looked like over the last seven years with Impact Forty Six? You got zeroed in. What's the results? Um, so I do get a lot of scowls because I'm so focused, <clears throat> and I want to say that first. Because when you are focused and you have the blinders on, a lot of people will come to you to fix things and you have to say no. And by saying no, you're saying maybe not right now and maybe not in 10 years, but if we focus on this, it may actually fix what you ultimately want. So let's talk about food insecurity as an example. We don't focus on that. We actually focus on holistic care and so we bring in partners that obviously will help with food insecurity, but we look at why are you food insecure? We try to answer that question. So we look at your wage. Well, when you're paying 60% of your salary towards housing, you're always going to need supplemental income to pay for housing. So I cannot write enough grants or ask for enough money to provide that much housing. And so you can go crazy but I see that happening over and over and over again. And so really attacking things at a root level is so important, but it's so hard because it's a 10 year, 20 year vision. 
And so we have really focused um, on education, and that's really the development part of what we do. So we work a lot with our schools, and I'm dedicated to those schools. Like I said, I graduated from Collins Hill High School, but I'm a black knight <laughs> because I love Central Winnet High School and that cluster, and I'm a Discovery Titan because I love Discovery High School and those schools that are associated. I know the principals, I know the administrators, I know the students, our staff does, because we're in those schools constantly building relationships um, with the students and the administrators. And then once they see success happening, then impact comes. So again, you gotta work on the collective before you wanna see impact, and people often reverse those. Mm -hmm. And then with housing, it's at a much higher level. It's looking at the overall health of what's happening in Lawrenceville, and so we're all very well aware of what's happening with housing on a national level. Well, then what does that mean for our city? And again, we say our city. We live there, we worship there, we learn there, we play there, we go to restaurants. It's our city, which means that we have to take care of it. So those are not just students, those are my kids. And I've got thousands of kids that I've got to think for and that we love. And then we've got thousands of neighbors. So when people are homeless, they're not just homeless residents, those are my homeless neighbors. So what does it mean to care for our city? That's why we have to think on a deeper level. I just want to add on to that. I think uh, focusing in on your community is very, very important. As a government, a local government, we are as close to the people as a government that you can get. The, the higher up you go, from a Gwinnett County standpoint, state of Georgia, federal government, a lot, of, a lot of folks want to focus at a national level in some of the national programs, a lot of the state programs, um, and some of the issues you hear, uh, is, you know, even talking about housing, what, what we have done as a local government, we focused on large, but what is our housing issue? And what are the specific needs to our community? So the government that's the closest to the people is your local government. And so I would challenge you, just as Jim did, you need to know your, your, the, your local government uh, elected official. And that could be a county commissioner if you're not in the city, but if you're in the city, you need to know those local government folks because they are there to help uh, keep the community stable, to uplift the community and things like that. So the more you can get focused in your community using the term that Jen said, as a local, local government, these, uh, our city council, they, are, they don't get caught up in the, the statewide initiatives or the Gwinnett County-wide initiatives because it, it doesn't really matter what's happening, generally speaking, in Snellville or Norcross. They know what's happening in Lawrenceville. And these folks are committed to Lawrenceville. Uh, they're not looking for that next step of what uh, position are they going to run for. And as a staff member, that's very, very uh, encouraging to know that I've got a committed group of elected officials uh, that are working with staff, that are working with community partners to fix our specific need because you, each of our communities are different uh, in Gwinnett County, DeKalb County, Fulton County. So the closer you can get to the people and find those solutions that are specific to your community, the better. I want to, I just want to lift up what you said, Jen, and I, I hope we didn't miss that, is that we can be known for what we're for more than what we're against. It, that, that there's so much that the church community um, unfortunately is known for what we're against but it's something for saying this is my city this is my community um, this is our responsibility to see it flourish so I, I just wanted to say that was amazing what we're for um, matters a lot more in this case but I, I want to tap, tap on government again um, because a lot of people are looking to government to fix the problem. Um, maybe because of the systems, because they're think, because that impacts every facet of people's lives um, in some way. But how would you see that relationship, or how have you help to um, mend the relationship between community and government to to, to their being of effectiveness? Um, but what have you seen as as, as useful? for government community relationships and how the 46 help with making that reality? Yeah, well, that's a tough, that's a tough question to answer yes, in a small yes. amount of time. Um, government doesn't 
do everything very well. <laughs> I'm shocked. <laughs> I can say that because I am, I am a, a government official. Um, we need partners. We need, uh, there's, there's certain restraints and, and laws and things that we have to stay within boundaries. That limits our overall impact of things that we can do. Now we can partner with organizations that can get, take that mission and uh, go directly into the community. And I think that's where I think I feel like over the last decades, the church has kind of kind of withered away a little bit of working in the community. Like um, I, I hear stories from my parents and other folks that the churches used to do, or even nonprofits for that matter. And so um, I, I think uh, government needs to be there to uh, help with the structures um, and to, to make sure that the, 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 the overall city or the county as a whole um, uh, continues to rise. But you, you have to have those partners but, uh, at, from the faith-based community to dive into the community and to work on those initiatives to uplift your community. I'll give a practical example where we really saw this. This was in 2020, um, after the murder of George Floyd, um, when we had protests in Lawrenceville. And they were organized and structured and facilitated by students, ages 18 to around 23. And none of them lived in Lawrenceville. Yet, they knew about Lawrenceville. It was the county seat. And so they had everybody come to the streets of Lawrenceville. Well, then who has to organize and make sure that that is safe? The government. <laughs> so then you pull in the municipality to be a part of that. We have a Lawrenceville Police Department. They have to be a part of that. And what I loved about what happened after those protests was that our county government, our city government and council members sat down with the students. It wasn't just about Let's make sure that no one gets hurt, nothing's damaged. It was, what is at the root of why they're here? And let's listen to them. Community listening is essential. And that's really where we try to take what's happening at a community level and then inform, engage, and educate our community on the systems that they want to see effective. But they are so ignorant on how to do that. Well, who's an expert? the city employees. <laughs> and so what Impact 46 really tries to do is be the facilitator and the guide of those conversations and bringing people to the table and having hard conversations. And they are very hard conversations. And oftentimes people leave disgruntled because they're not seeing change happen like that. And they want change to happen like that. Um, and if you know anything with government, slow. <laughs> there's lots of things. There's red tape and there's different things and that's why I would encourage you to get to know the, what is the red tape because then you'll understand why things don't change. Can they change? And what our students came in with is that they wanted our police chief to change things that were happening in other states. So they were just clueless on how all those things happened. But what happened through that is that we applied for a grant that would bring in support, and through that we started um, a youth council. And so a lot of those students get to now sit with our city council members, and even tonight we're doing that with a celebration dinner, and they get to have those conversations. And so now we're educating our youth, who are the next generation leaders that we're trying to keep here, not go to another place, but we're invested in them. We're invested in who they are as people and want to make sure that they're well informed on how to make change happen and for good. Uh, yeah, I, I hope it's hitting you as hard as it's hit me uh, talking about the slowness of collective impact. Um, I come from the church world. Many people are here you probably work with churches or you attend the church. Um, things can seem to happen very fast, seemingly, and there seems to be big results that come very quickly. Um, but you said something earlier, Jen, of the slog, that at least 10 
10, 15, 20 years of being committed to a place, and then you may see something happen. What is that, how does that translate to community, um, to asset-based community development? How does that translate to the community uh, that wants to see results? What do you do in the meantime? Uh, that's a hard question. Because <laughs> it's not an easy answer. You work. <laughs> and you just keep working. I mean, I think that's, if there are any grandparents in the room, those are your joys, right? Like when you get to sit back and see your, your children create other human beings, there's such pride in that. Um, and I, I love to tell stories. We're storytellers in Lawrenceville. But um, where it really clicked for me that you had to um, really be invested in a long-term strategy and plan was one time we were um, we we're doing a lot of um, programming with kids in Augusta um, and this lady approached us one time and she lived in this apartment complex where we had finally built a field because in downtown Augusta um, the crime was so bad that they had a park but kids couldn't play safely at the park and so we created a green space that had a fence it had security, it had lighting, um, so it was safe. And we were um, going around talking to our neighbors that we were gonna put on kind of a, a Halloween festival. And this lady came up to us the day after the festival and we thought, oh gosh, she's gonna yell at us because we were loud and it was 10 p.m. and there were still kids. And she came up to me and we were talking and she just starts crying. And I was like, why are you crying, are you okay? And she was like, for 25 years, I've sat at this window praying that kids would have a safe place to play. And so she was invested in our community through prayer. And for 25 years, the only thing that would bring her to tears and joy was children's laughter. And I just thought about that for a minute. It's like, um, it's a small significant thing, but it meant so much to her because she saw transformation. And that's what we want to see in our communities. We want them to be transformed. Yes, we see needs. Yes, we see devastation. But in order for us to really sit back and enjoy the work is when you see things that were impossible become possible. And that does not happen overnight. Chuck, you, I don't know if you have a story like Jen, because Jen is an amazing storyteller. <laughs> but what, what, what has this process been like for you in the last seven years? What have you seen as far as impact? But before I, I guess I tell a story, one of the things that, uh, just kind of building off what Jen said, um, is the sustainability. Um, we live in a fast food culture. We want everything now. Um, we want Amazon, we want to buy it on Amazon. We want our community to change, just like we buy on Amazon. We want it overnight. And I, I think if we really kind of take a step back and think about the things that are sustainable are developed over time. And I think what you're hearing here is it's not going to happen overnight. You've got to be committed long term. Um, I think one of the, 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 the quick story that kind of goes that had a big impact on me um, it was at the same protest. Um, we ended up having like seven, eight hundred people at this one area, and we had kind of uh, had had them specifically you know, at City Hall. We had the mayor who was uh, down with a bullhorn having conversations with folks. I was walking in the crowd having conversations, but I want to tell you one little story about this conversation that had an impact on me that, tell, that reminded me you got to continue having conversations. There were two folks that had, uh, uh, they were in their 20s, had signs, and they had, it was horrible language about police, uh, empty police, whatever. It was just, so I walked up and I said, yeah, what, what's going on? Oh, I'm, I graduated from Discovery High School. Um, why are you here? Well, you know, Minnesota, you know, bad stuff going on there. And I said, okay, have you had any issues here in, in Lawrenceville? No, I haven't, but you know, what happened in Minnesota? Okay, that's great. So you're from Lawrenceville? Yes, I'm from here. And so we started having a dialogue. Well, what, what is it in your community you're concerned about? It's accountability of the police or whatever. And I said, and so none of this time I had a name tag on, they didn't know who it was. And I, at that point I said, would you, would you mind having a conversation with a police officer? And they said, we'd love to tell a police officer what we think. And I said, well, I'm the city manager. And you can imagine what their, their response was like, whoa. And I said, let's go over here and talk to this police officer. And I'll go over here, 
we had this conversation with this police officer, and I said, you see that little thing right there in the middle? I said, that's a camera. That's what we hold our uh, police officers accountable. At any point, you can pull that camera. It is on 24 hours. And so that's how we hold that accountability. So we continue the dialogue um, to the point where um, we, we, uh, we kind of moved back over and I finished the conversation and I said, uh, here's my card. If you want to have more conversation, let's continue to have that conversation. Um, at that point, another bullhorn showed up and so I went over and started having some conversations over here. I watched these two young people take their signs and they go through them in the trash and they put them on in front of City Hall where we had them. And I hadn't seen them all night. I said, I didn't, have, I didn't say anything about that. Mm -hmm. But they threw them down. Now they got back in and they continued to protest as they, as they were there, but they were there for. But just having a conversation, mm -hmm. I think they realized as a young adult, probably not the best way to make change is to have in that type of language um, on, on a sign. Um, maybe we need to get engaged. And so uh, to kind of build off of what Jen said, it, it had an impact on me because those conversations have got to continue. And those are intentional conversations. Uh, we shouldn't wait on those individuals to come to us. We need to go out into those communities all over our city and have conversations, build relationships, show how there is accountability in our community. I can't have, I can't control, the mayor can't control, the police chief can't control what happens in Washington, D.C., Minnesota, anywhere else. We can control what happens here. And the, your community needs to understand that they have a say in that. And so we need to have those dialogue uh, over and over and over. And it's not a one-time thing, and it happens over years to come. Thank you for that, Chuck. I, I will say it's very hard to hate someone that you know, that your relationship with. It's hard, it's, it's hard to see them as the enemy when you are in conversation. So I think that that's very important to continue to have those conversations. I, I want to zero back in on the church real quick because, again, that's what, we work with churches and we love churches and we love what they represent for our communities. We love the way in which they are the epicenter for uh, much life, but it can be difficult. Um, what advice, what, what advice would you give churches who want to get involved in collective impact? Ooh, now I'm starting to sweat. Um, <laughs> so I've, I've worked in churches. I was on staff with First Pres in Augusta and then um, in Lawrenceville with uh, Lawrenceville First Baptist. Um, churches hate this awful word called change. Um, <laughs> and uh, y'all are all grown in, and I'm right there with you because um, on a Sunday morning, um, if something doesn't work, we all hear about it, right? Um, they're going to pull you aside. Um, funny story. Again, there was a guy at a church that I used to work for, and he would always email me during the sermon. But he would never fill out the email. He would send the entire email in the subject line. Um, <laughs> so Monday mornings were quite funny. Um, and uh, we all know him. He's a, he used to be a... Vice Superintendent of Gwinnett County Public Schools, so he had a lot of opinions. But, um, but anyway, uh, he hated change. And he always said, I didn't know about that. And we all know as churches, you got a bulletin, you've got video, you know, you've got all these different things where you're communicating, um, but change is hard, except when you want good change, right? And so you want good change in communities. And I think that's where the rub is is that um, within church culture, um, you're dealing with history, you're dealing with legacy, you're dealing with um, you know, multiple building renovations. Um, so you've seen a lot of change happen, and that's also reflected in the city. And so I think a church is very well set up, unlike any other sector, to actually affect change in a community. Because where else can you go on a Sunday where there's tons of different businesses represented, tons of different schools, tons of different backgrounds, ethnicities, opinions, ideas, um, that's represented in a church. But what we don't see often in church is one vision. That vision often changes in a church because again, you've got to keep up with 
your sermons and you gotta you know make it fresh and new so collective impact is hard in a church because again it's a long-term vision and strategy that stays the course but there's ways to keep that fresh and innovative um, and I think the key point is finding those leaders that really believe um, in your vision and nurturing those relationships and then I, I really believe in bringing students along um, nobody that I've ever met says I don't want students to succeed. And so when students are at the heart of what you're doing, people jump on it. And that has great change and significant impact within a city when you focus on kids. Before you say that, Chuck, I want to say, as a faith few leader, <laughs> Chuck, how have, you, how have you seen the work of church in this space of collective impact? How do you see it? Well, it's Finding a way, I think the, the key word is collective. It's not individual. It's, you, typically at a church, you'll have one person who's passionate about um, a clothes drive, a clothes drive, or a, a food drive. And then a lot of times that church kind of comes in behind that and, and that does it as part of the community. That may, may not be the number one need that your community needs at this point. And so, Finding out from various leaders, not just government leaders, but finding out uh, what what can you come alongside with and, and it becomes a force multiplier in your community because there's already things happening in regards to government support of it. There's possibly some funding and some initiatives around them. Um, so you know, in, our, in our case, we have uh, churches that will come to us and say we want to do, we want to give um, uh, fans out last summer. Um, the, the electric fans out. We're, we're going to be at our police department and we've got, you know, 100 fans we're going to give out to the community because it's 100 degrees in the community. Well, that's great. I love you want to do it. Thank you for doing that. And they went ahead and did it with our police department. But it, it, can you imagine if we got that same passion and support if they came alongside with some of the, the, the other initiatives that we feel are, are, are number one in our community that can directly help? Um, I'm not sure electric fans is our number one uh, issue. Now again, I, I, sounds negative related to that organization, but I think you kind of understand the point. Um, we, have, we have all these individual visions in your community. We could collectively pull these passions and the, the volunteers together with one or two or three uh, items. You can change your community, and that's where the collective impact happens. <coughs> Since you guys are telling stories, I do have a quick story of my, my time working in Gwinnett at a church, and um, every Saturday we would do food giveaways, and we went to extended stay, and we were giving away food, and um, it's amazing. Until I met a single father who stayed in that extended stay, and um, as we're handing out food and, and lunch, um, he says, hey man, I really appreciate what you guys are doing. This is amazing. Um, but is there, I really need help with my resume. Mm -hmm. I said, oh, this, this, this wasn't, in my mind, saying this, this wasn't helping, the, sometimes the arrogance of service mm -hmm. can lead to the illusion mm -hmm. of impact. Right. Yeah. Right. What I thought I was doing wasn't what was needed. Right. What he needed was an opportunity for sustainability. That's right. Yes. I, I, I'll shout this from the rooftop because the church is the vehicle in which I believe God is changing and trying to transform cities, but we get in our own way of doing the work of God because we're doing the work of the church. The, the examples that you guys. Dang it, it now goes to the day. Right? We'll figure this out, Jim, tonight. All right? I'll be in Lawrenceville tonight. Yes, we'll figure this out tonight. I, I, I said that because there's so much value in what you guys are bringing and saying that we love what the church is doing, but is that what's needed? And how can the church walk alongside 
what is happening. Um, Zakia Williams is not here, but Zakia Williams is a executive director of ACD. You should connect with her. But at one of our focus groups, she said something that um, stuck me. She said, listen, most cities already have a city plan. Like they, they already know what's happening in that city. Maybe you should also figure out what's happening in that city before you start anything else. That was supposed to lead to a question. Now I got, I got fired up because of you guys. <laughs> that was supposed to lead to something. You, you made a great point. It's my turn to kind of interpret. Yes, you, go ahead, Jim. Take it. I, I think you brought up, you know, three great things. One, you have to define what is health. So, as a church, if your definition of health in a community is that person has food because I gave it to them. You may want to question yourself. And then second, what is help? And how do you define that? We want to help our community. We hear that all the time. What does that mean? And how are you um, defining that? And then what is influencing your definitions? And then I think lastly, one thing that the church can really do is create opportunities. And that's what opens doors. And that's what that man was asking for, is he's stuck in an extended stay and needs an opportunity out. A peanut butter sandwich does not do that. Mm. And in our community, people don't want to hear that. And that's hard for me. Um, because again, we have a long-term vision for Lawrence, but you're exactly right. We're in the process of doing the comprehensive plan for 2045. I don't even know if I'll be in Lawrenceville in 2045, but it matters because what we're, we're deciding now, the next two generations will inherit. So we've got to think about that. It matters what we're putting in, what we're planting, what we're developing, because it, it's not going to be our problem potentially, but it'll be someone's problem. So I want to be a good elder to the next generation. So again, I think think about opportunities in your church, what you can create, um, how do you define help, and how do you define health? Well, start good conversations or hard ones. Chuck, you want to jump in? I know there's a lot of fire going on right now. Okay. I don't know. So I'm late to the game watching Chosen, okay? And I've been really impacted by it. I, it's been very interesting because of the character and how they're developed. But one thing that just came to my mind, if you think about what Jesus did, he didn't, he, he didn't have a, uh, a food drive when he, when he did the fed the 5,000. He met that need at that moment. That community needed that need at that moment. When he healed somebody else from the leper, he met that specific need. So you think about what Jesus did when he went to the different communities. He met the individual's need in that community. He didn't go say, okay, I'm going to do a leper ministry. He can go start doing uh, healing lepers all over. No, he met the individual's need where they were at. That's what we as a church, we need to find out what those needs are. Come alongside the leaders in the community. I see you trying to get on that plate, Chuck. It's all right. It's all right. We can figure that out. We can, we can figure that out. We can figure that out. <laughs> I, I, I don't want. I also want. I don't want to um, make this just about what churches aren't doing because churches are doing some amazing things, right? Um, Tito, our board chair, our wonderful board chair here, uh, Pastor Stone of Church of Duluth. Um, Tito serves as, also as an interpreter for the local school there in Duluth. And Tito, that was directly off the question of how can I serve, not what can I give you, but how can I serve you where you are, and that was a direct need, right? But I also want to put nonprofits off the hook too, right, of, of kind of being in the space of um, uh, oversaturation, but no impact, right? So, you know, just, just let, if you're part of nonprofit, we also talk about you too, the ages of the churches, nonprofits as well. I, I, I do want to um, kind of give opportunity also for some, some hope and next steps, if that's possible, of what is possible then? What's possible when we focus on the collective, when we focus on the community? What, what have you seen as being uh, the hope? So for us to be hopeful, like with, with our organization, we have an acronym. We want to be pros at um, everything in our city. And the acronym, uh, the P stands for we want to be people focused. 
we want to, the R is responsibility. We're going to take responsibility for what's happening in our community. And then the O is operationally excellent. So whatever we do, we're going to be excellent at it because we're focused on people. So when our programming is excellent, people will benefit and we're hoping that they're better um, for it. Um, so I think with, with hope, it's a preferred future, right? That, that's really what the definition is. Um, we all have a preferred future for ourselves, for our families, for our communities. But what is the preferred future for your neighborhood and your city? No one asks that in the church. But I think if you sat down and asked that question, one, what's beautiful about that is you're going to get tons of different answers mm -hmm. because of the perspective, the vantage point, and where people sit within a community. And that's where you're going to have hard conversations, too. Because a preferred future for a student may be my parents to stop fighting. Well, then what's beautiful is that you're in a church where people are saying, okay, maybe we need to invest in family. So instead of going, how do we change things? Just listen, just have conversations and ask them the questions. And that will give you hope because that will actually give you the answer. But if you come with the answer, hoping to implement a program, Jesus. you're not gonna get much. No community is beyond hope. And so as you work in your community and you work with the other leaders in the community, understand that no community is beyond hope. It just it takes time, it takes effort, it takes intentionality. Um, and I think that's, that's an important thing uh, to me. I'm reminded of uh, a podcast I listened to this morning on the way in uh, that was centered around five, uh, Psalms 5-3, where it talks about you get up in the morning, you pray to God, and you pray expectantly. You're expecting. It really challenged me this morning because as a task guy, um, mm -hmm. as an engineer, a linear mind, I'm constantly thinking about task and you've got to do this, this, and this. But as I, am, as I am praying, and I'm praying for my community, am I truly expecting change? Am I expecting something? Because if I pray to God, I'm, these are just false words. These are words that God asks us to, to come to Him. And so that really challenged me this morning. Are you expecting something to happen? As you, as you pray and you uh, think about it. Can I have one more thing? Um, I heard a quote that you repeat what you celebrate, and I fully believe in that. That's good. So oftentimes we celebrate the negative by talking about it. So think about what you're celebrating, not in terms of celebration, but what are you talking about constantly? If you're talking about needs constantly, you're celebrating devastation. If you are talking and celebrating the smallest thing, it has the ability, it's like the butterfly wings, it has the ability to bring even more hope. So I think that's a challenge for you guys. To, it's a changing perspective. And that's where asset-based community development really comes into play. What are the good things and the assets in your community? And how do we wrap ourselves around that and celebrate it? And it doesn't have to be big. It can be so small. Um, you know, thinking about the first steps of a kid. It's tiny, right? Because then they fall, and then they keep falling, and then finally they can walk and they can run, and then you just want to take a nap um, because you're exhausted. But you celebrated the first steps. So celebrate first steps in your church. Can we just breathe? <laughs> oh, I think this is a beautiful conversation. I invite you as a leader, as a leader, as a faith leader, um, to imagine, to imagine. I wonder what could happen, Jen, if we had churches in a particular neighborhood that said that we are going to commit 10, 15 years of our strategic development, our strategic plan to working with other partners in our community, other churches, to see see the flourishing of our neighborhood, our city. I just I just wonder what could happen if 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 we actually did that. I, I do want to leave time for questions. This is a lot to take in. Um, I, I say for me because it's it's heavy stuff and it doesn't always feel good, but there's hope. I want to give um, 
time for anybody who has questions for Jen and for Chuck or for the, for the city council that's sitting here. They can't vote on anything right now, but they're here. Right? So, Lee, yeah, I, I have a question for Jen. Just curious, if you, you, you talked about how Impact 46 started with the prayer meeting. What is the role that individual churches are playing with Impact 46 now? That's a tough one. Um, each church is involved, um, and some of them give, but ultimately what we would really love to see is a collective of churches where we're all having a, a conversation about our city and how to really invest in the city um, while using the assets within that localized church to benefit the city. So not changing the direction or the focus of the church, but just helping them be more focused. Um, and so it, one of the ways that we really benefited from all the local churches was in COVID, when we started the Lawrenceville Response Center. It would have never opened without local churches. They were the first ones at the door saying, how do we help? Um, so that is, people come to a church when they're in need. They don't go anywhere else. They complain to the government, but they go to church. Um, and so I think that's what's special about the relationship, is it looks like there's a disconnect, but there's actually a common ground. Um, and so for us in Lawrenceville, local churches, we're inviting them to the table to actually listen to our students, and that's all we kind of ask. <laughs> um, so the ask is very easy, it's very low, um, but participation is also low, um, because it's not get up and do something. And that, that's what's hard for churches, I think, is they want to do something, they want to feel good. Um, they want to fix the problem, right? And we're saying, um, we got to start with a different strategy than just doing, um, because you actually don't know your neighbor. And so you're assuming that they're without because they have, they don't have something that you have. Um, and that's, that's a, that's a bad position to take. Off from play the time again. <laughs> I have the easiest question you're going to get asked today and probably all year. You mentioned pro, P-R-O. I missed what the O was for. <laughs> Operational excellence. Operational I'll go into a little bit of that about that. I'm a big person on data. Um, we have to have data to measure things. Yep. So, you know, I said you gotta you gotta define the word help and you've got to define the word health. In order to do that, you gotta be able to measure it. And so um, we look at several things. So for us to be operationally excellent, it means that we have to have systems in place to be able to measure our success and our failures so that we can take responsibility and go back and make sure that we're serving people. Do you use easy metrics or hard metrics? Depends, I don't know. <laughs> um, we, we don't look at just the basic things, like everybody will look at graduation rates. We look at things like engagement. Um, here's something simple. Kids love social media. We have an account that our students are running that only has 100 plus followers. It does more on engagement in accounts with 10,000 followers mm -hmm. because kids are engaged and they're leading it. So they're the ones running it. Um, it makes them feel special. It makes them feel important. And so we take that and say, let's take advantage of that relationship and inform them and educate them. I ask it because a lot of times we as leaders, we look for the easy metric. And we say, oh, this was easy to do. This will make us look good. We say we do this. But the hard things what really needs to get done is we avoid that hard metric. And so we let ourselves off the hook. Whenever you allow people to, to grade themselves, they tend to grade themselves easier. Usually, not always, but that's why I say thank you. Thank you for that. Anastasia and then I saw Okay. Hi, I have several questions, so I'm asking one. Um, <laughs> and um, so I'm I'm newish to a community in terms of living there, but I've worked there for like a long time. Um, and I want to better engage city officials, church um, leaders, business owners, like even other educators on like what, just what the need is. And so my question is like, what are the best questions that you've asked these types of people that yielded the best answers? That's really good um, there's no generic answer. Yeah. And I think that's part of it, is um, if you can learn to be the best question asker, mm -hmm. you'll become the best listener. Mm -hmm. And so it's just starting out with, you know, what do you love to do in the city? 
We, our favorite question to ask anybody in Lawrenceville is, what do you love about Lawrenceville? Mm -hmm. And that tells us, one, do they live here? <laughs> <laughs> and two, what they enjoy. And then you just go deeper and deeper. Well, why do you love Local Republic? If you could have any other restaurant in here, what would you have? Mm -hmm. So then we can have a conversation about the city. Um, so it's just, again, it's just building on conversations, but um, talk, you, don't be afraid to talk about what you're passionate about too because um, that often will spark conversation as well. But just, I love asking questions. That's why I'm terrible on dates. Um, <laughs> but I, 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 I do, I just, I love asking questions and because um, it engages you. And again, it's, it's listening to, to hear them, not listening to be heard. Mm -hmm. I could just jump in with one, with one more. Okay, it's about um, getting students involved, right? Like I'm an educator and so always centering kids and giving kids more credit for like how can, they engage in their own flourishing is really important to me. But what have you discovered as like best practices for increasing the political literacy of children and also increasing their uh, engagement in their own community? So one again, it's going back to asking them, what do they know about? One of the things that we did, we started a program because of COVID, we were, we were listening to educators and they were saying, our kids are so unengaged, they're so tired, they're on screens all day. Um, and they're just losing relationships left and right. And so um, we thought long and hard and we were like, okay, how can we meet the need in the school that we're hearing and being asked to fulfill from the educators? But then also how can we involve them in a fun, low-key event um, that they would not say they naturally needed, but we know that's what they're looking for, which is relationships. So we created something so easy called Love Lawrence Hill Day. And the kids come in shadow at City Hall for just an hour. It's an hour. But they get to um, hear about the city. They, we actually don't let them ride the bus when they go to the different places they're shadowing. They have to walk everywhere. Um, when you walk in a city, you see a city. And so they're seeing things they never saw before. Um, oh, I didn't know we had a go-go tea. Like, yeah, we do. Let me tell you about it. Um, in fact, let's go grab some tea. Um, and so it's little things like that. It's just, and so for you, like as an educator, we were listening and we were hearing, um, we see that you love students, but you're not doing anything for special needs. So we found two special needs businesses that cater to special needs students and said, would you be a part of Love Lawrenceville Day? But again, it was asking that question and then having the relationship with the educator where she could feel free to say, love what you're doing, but, so if you're going to ask questions, you also have to be willing to hear feedback, mm -hmm. even when it's negative. And then turn that into an opportunity, mm -hmm. which is what we try to do in Lawrenceville. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, thank you both for sharing with us what you shared. It's been insightful. Um, then you talked about vision and keeping the vision in the front. And any organizational leader knows that vision leads. And so how do you personally uh, keep the vision in front of your organization, in front of your staff and volunteers to make sure you all are continuing to push forward. We present the vision statement after um, in every meeting. And then we just say, are we on target? <laughs> so a lot of people write vision, mission, value statements, and then they go on a shelf. Mm -hmm. um, but that's your compass. Mm -hmm. And that's what you use to guide you for everything. So if you want, you know, we have a new vision statement that says we want to make uh, Lawrenceville the healthiest city in Gwinnett County. Well, if one, we're not defining what that looks like, and then two, we're not measuring that, we'll never know if we actually accomplish it. So um, I meet a lot of people with vision, and then they have no plan. So you have to create a plan to accomplish the vision, or you'll never get there. You'll just be in the cloud without a plan. Jen, um, thank you so much to both of you for sharing. Um, to, for what I hear is the that because of Impact 46, Lawrenceville is very spoiled. <laughs> so it's, it's, you are golden in Lawrenceville. My question is, are, do you know of like-minded organizations in other cities? Because um, I don't live in Lawrenceville, I live in Cumming. We serve at Berth Berkeley Lake, and so we're all over the place. Are there other organizations that's, that share the same, your same values? 
I'm sure there's similar ones. Um, I think Unite does a great job. Again, the role that we play is vastly different from other nonprofits. We specialize in Lawrenceville. So we're very flexible in what we can do. Whereas a nonprofit that starts to be, uh, you know, give out books, well, they're, they're very narrowly defined. We are very broadly defined. Um, however, we've got some things in place that keep us very focused. Um, so uh, we're very different and different on purpose. And I don't find a lot of nonprofits functioning quite like we are. If they are, they're at a larger scale, um, or oftentimes they become institutions or something like that. So we're, I think we're pretty unique in the situation that we are, um, but we're doing that on purpose. Right. And just so, just so you'll know, Impact 46 refers to the zip code 30046, which is downtown Washington. Right. So that's, um, in and I'll let you take it there. You can't quote it, can you? I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> Psalm 46.4, it says, There's a river whose streams make glad the city of God where the Most High dwells. That's my definition. We want to make Lawrenceville a glad city. It's a beautiful city that people want to live in. It's flourishing. Um, so we play that unique role of being in the middle. You guys ready to go? I mean, go and conquer and, and do the work that it, mean, that it takes to do city transformation work. So um, let's give Jen and Chuck.